Hi, I'm Tanik Sims too, but you can call me Tani, and welcome to the second part of How Corrupt Is Strangetown Anyway? In the first part, we covered all the weird, dead, ancestral sims in Strangetown, including those buried in Olive's garden, so I definitely recommend checking that video out first if you haven't already. But if you're ready for this part, make sure you've got some snacks and settle down somewhere comfy, because we're going to jump right in. When The Sims 2 was released back in 2004, one of its biggest USPs was the introduction of genetics. The system was so advanced and complex even compared to later games in the franchise that it is perhaps not surprising that it took a lot of finessing to get right. It seems that, sometime in development, the DNA mechanics were either changed or expanded upon. However, as established in the previous part, Strangetown was a testing ground where a lot of elements scrapped in development were never updated. This led to a lot of Sims character data shipping in outdated formats, including their DNA. Despite the hype around genetics, players were in for a shock when they began playing Strangetown's next generation. It would be easier to list the sims in Strangetown whose DNA isn't balked in some way. In fact, let's get them out of the way. All the townies, plus AJ Lona, Pascal, and Laszlo Curious are fine. Baratron, a more awesome than you user who took the time to correct each sim's DNA, also listed Nervous Subject as being okay, but noted that he wasn't quite accurate, most likely because his mother, Olive, is missing the information for genetic skin tone, and Nervous is most likely a clone of his soul-reaping father. All the rest of the playable sims though are either completely missing DNA strings altogether, or even have both missing and extra DNA. This isn't just a case of sim DNA being unable to open in sim PE however. Whole chunks of DNA are missing from most Strangetown sims, resulting in some very genetically impossible offspring. A notable example is everyone's favourite retired alien, Pollination Tech 9, who has both missing and extra DNA strings. If a player manages to, say, have Jenny fall pregnant again with Paul's baby, the baby or babies might have the four skin tone. This doesn't make much sense. No one in Jenny's family has the skin tone and most of all, the alien skin is extremely dominant, so it should have been passed on. The reason is simple. Paul is missing strings for the skin tone passed on section in his sim DNA. Therefore, the baby could be born with the default skin tone, skin tone 4, because the game has no other genetic information to go off of. Annoyingly, I tried about three times to see if I could show this in action, but the game decided to actually work properly for once. This could be due to the fact he does have the correct alien skin string for skin tone range in his DNA, despite his other missing skin tone genes. But the point still stands that Paul is missing skin tone genetics, as are pretty much every sim in this town and you may potentially see the results of their bought DNA in your own game. Additionally, a major problem players reported back in the day was crashing when pre-made sims in Strangetown were giving birth, namely Lola and Chloe Singles. The game could not assign a skin tone to the babies, resulting in crashes. This was reportedly fixed with the uni slash nightlife patch, however I decided to mention it anyway because it is further evidence of the problematic nature of missing DNA and how it could render households or even whole hoods completely unplayable. Besides, while the crashing may have been fixed, Lola and Chloe's DNA weren't. Again, maybe it's because I have the ultimate collection or something, but they were able to have genetically accurate offspring in my recordings. It's more a word of warning, just in case it happens in your game. Cast your mind back to the Pleasant View video. Remember how there are a total of three duplicate sims who are just hidden in the game files for no apparent reason? Yeah, this issue isn't unique to Pleasant View. You may recognise this face as your sleep paralysis demon, or from this pre-release trailer for The Sims 2. Either way, this is the hidden clone of Nervous Subject. 
Like with the doppelgangers in Pleasant View, this nervous appears to be the original version. Not only does he feature in this Friday the 13th video, but you can also see him in these beta screenshots of the game, where his less than loving adoptive parents also have different faces. What's odd about this nervous, however, is that he has the same set of memories as his playable counterpart, whilst the hidden sims in Pleasant View don't have memories. This implies he was most likely intended to be playable, further supported by the fact he has a portrait of him as an elder in his character file. His barebones hyperactive personality is also consistent with the final released version of Nervous. Additionally, this is the Nervous his mother Olive Spectre remembers giving birth to, although they do not know or recognise one another as family, and he does have family ties with his late aunt Willow and his cousin Ophelia Nygmos, while the playable Nervous doesn't. Cersei and Loki also have memories that point to the hidden Nervous, however they have no relationship with him. Also for some reason, a load of strays are randomly placed in the Spectre household, even though they don't appear in game, <laughs> and I have absolutely no idea why this has happened. Another odd thing about the two Nervous subjects is that Nervous is, of course, a living playable sim whereas the hidden sims in Pleasant View are dead ancestral sims. However, the hidden Nervous is basically dead. He is in the default household alongside universal NPCs and other deceased sims, and he has a death token, explaining why he won't suddenly show up in the neighbourhood. He also has no character data either. There are two main theories as to why there are two nervous subjects. One of them relies on the in-game lore of Cersei and Loki Beaker adopting nervous for their sordid experiments, possibly due to his supposed father's identity. However, maybe something went very wrong, hence why the hidden nervous is dead, but they managed to clone him before he died. The other theory is that it was simply a mistake on the developer's part, and more evidence of Strangetown being pretty foobard. What do you think? We've covered the unplayable ancestral sims and their balkness, and we've touched upon some of the problems with the playable sims. But what about the townies? They must be okay, right? Well, would it surprise you if I told you they're all broken too? Every single townie in Strangetown has career information that's corrupted or missing, and the game cannot recognise any of their job data. Most of them are also lacking skill information. Usually, townies' careers are randomised. However, there are sims who are supposed to have specific careers, only for them to be broken due to their corrupted career information. For example, Abhijit Cho is intended to be level 5 in the athletic career, or an MVP, judging by his preset skills and career level. Only, the game isn't properly recognising his job information. He is considered to be employed in a job that doesn't exist, however apparently he works 24 hours a day. Upon unpausing the game, he was placed in a random career, except it doesn't match his intended job. Other sims with this problem include Cooper Olschke, Rene Andrews, Holly Anderson, Blair Mace, and, most famously, Bella Goth. This issue of corrupted skill and career information isn't confined to older sims. Quite a few child and teenage townies face the same problem, only they are also missing school information. A notable example is that of Esther Se. Okay, so she's not technically a townie per se, she's a newspaper delivery person, so she's actually a service NPC. But she deserves to be mentioned because she is the most balked service NPC in Strangetown. Okay, most balked service NPC in Strangetown that's still alive. Though judging by the state of her character file, maybe she was intended as Olive's 22nd victim. Dorsal Axe, who recently released their own clean version of Strangetown with Townies, reports that Esther is flagged as a broken NPC, and that she doesn't function properly as a newspaper delivery person. Her school career is missing, meaning she is not enrolled in school, and much like most of the Townies in Strangetown, her skills and interests are missing in the game files and will be randomised. Moving on, this is more a timeline or memory inconsistency, but for some reason a few living townies have memories of certain sims dying, namely Danielle Greaves and Knut Futa. Blair Mace remembers the former's death, 
whilst Holly Anderson remembers the latter's. Not only is it odd that these townies have memories in the first place, since townies never start the game with memories, not even the basic cast ones, but there's no possible way these townies should have any knowledge of these NPCs' deaths. Danielle Greaves died when Olive was still a teenager, and at the start of the game she's one foot in her own grave. Townie immortality aside, how could a teenage townie remember something that was so far before their time? As if the townies and NPCs in Strangetown weren't bizarre enough, it's only going to get weirder when I introduce you to the worthy winner of the most bought living townie ever title. Imagine being so iconic that you land in this cursed series not once, but twice. It's easy if your name's Bella Goth. If we go with the theory that Bella Goth was abducted from Pleasant View and dropped off in Strangetown, it seems that aliens must have balked her pretty badly as this carnation of Bella is strange to say the least. First of all, while she is a townie in Strangetown, for some reason she's not actually in the townie bin or household. She's under the default household, like dead sims, universal NPCs and hidden clones. But she's not dead. She's not even in a limbo state like in Pleasant View. And she may be iconic, but she's not a special object sim. Clone is debatable, depending on which Bella you consider to be the real one. Her placement in the default household may explain her unlinked relationships with all the deceased sims, such as Willow Nygmas and Lila Grunt, though there's no real reason why she's even there in the first place. Not only that, but the hidden nervous subject also knows her. The problem arises, however, when you realise who else she has relationships with. Or rather, what else? Again, perhaps due to the fact that she's in the default household, Bella knows and has relationships with several object NPCs, such as the therapist, the Grim Reaper, Hula Zombie, and the remote controlled car. This is extremely dangerous because none of these NPCs should ever be interacted with outside of their in-game purposes or have any relationship with other sims whatsoever. It might not have been so worrying if it weren't for the fact these NPCs actually have relationship data with Bella in return. With the introduction of networking and apartment life came an even spicier ingredient in this recipe for total game corruption. Upon meeting a playable sim, Bella may attempt to introduce them to one of her NPC friends as a contact. Even if the player declines, townies who attempt the new friend networking interaction will gain a memory of meeting the random sim that is pulled from either the townie household or their own relationship list, and vice versa. Therefore, Strangetown Bella is not just a weird in-game mystery, she's one handshake away from blowing up your entire game. I highly recommend Sijon's mod New Friend Fix to prevent townies like Bella from trying to introduce dead sims and object NPCs to your sims. Your head's probably still hurting from the first part where we covered Mary Mellons, the grandmother of General Buzz Grunt, who considers herself to be a member of the Curious family, and touched upon the convoluted mess that is the Curious Smith family tree. I wish I could tell you Mary's the only one with inexplicable ties to the family, but yep, you guessed it. Turns out we have an eighth curious sibling in Belagoth for some reason. Oddly enough, her family ties are consistent with sims who actually do belong in the family, only for some flags to be missing, which we'll get onto soon. Apparently, Bella Goth is the aunt of Johnny and Jill Smith, who also recognise her as family. She and Vic and Curious recognise one another as siblings, similar to Mary Mellon's, but Jenny's sibling relation is one-sided, and Bella does not consider herself to be the sister of Pascal or Laszlo Curious either, though they do know each other. Again, this isn't the only example of extra and erroneous family ties involving the Curious Smith family, however. It seems that all the family ties in Strangetown are very knotted, if you thought Veronaville got interrelated pretty fast, Strangetown is on a whole other level. The Curious Smith family tree is both convoluted and incomplete, with quite a few ties missing on top of all the extra ones. Think of Jenny and Pollination Tech 9's children, Johnny and Jill Smith. On their father's side, Lola and Chloe Singles are their half-sisters, whereas on their mother's side, Lola and Chloe are their aunties. Not only that, but this means that Johnny and Jill Smith share half-siblings with their own mother. 
That would be pretty weird on its own, considering the game's inability to process family ties outside of immediate and very close extended family, but it gets weirder. Or grosser. While Chloe and Lola recognise Johnny and Jill Smith as their siblings, they are not considered related to their other half-siblings, Jenny Smith and the Curious Brothers, although it is worth noting that Jenny does have family interactions with the single sisters because they're also technically her stepdaughters. This could get funky pretty fast, especially if players don't realise Chloe and Lola should, in fact, be related to them and instead choose a different route for them. Or even without player intervention, they may have chemistry and begin romantic relationships autonomously. Yeah, I feel sick saying all that out loud too. <laughs> but guess I have to hold in my vomit because whilst browsing Simpy, I noticed Townie, Crystal Vu and Laszlo Curious have family flags for some reason, despite Lazo's unrequited crush on her. At least they'll usually have poor chemistry, I guess. Wanna know who else have random family flags? Cersei Beaker and Townie Abajicho. Why? Yeah, I have no idea either. This could possibly just be errors Max has never picked up on. However, family ties either going missing or appearing randomly is actually a sign of hood corruption. Though the first option is probably more likely, I am hesitant to rule out the second option. Whatever the reason, I imagine examples like Cersei and Loki Beaker sharing three parents were unlikely to have been intentional. Alright, just to round off this video, we're heading into Hood Checker now to see what it is able to pick up and possibly fix. As always, the link to download Hood Checker will be in the description below. And again, I recommend watching Moni's tutorial on how to use it if you're unsure. By the way, I just want to stress that I'm doing this on a totally untouched original copy of Strange Town that hasn't been generated in game yet. So these are the results for the hood as it comes. And it's a big, big log, bigger than Pleasant Views. But we have a lot of the same beginning issues with a lot of non-existent sims having relationships with mostly dead sims, the ancestral sims like General Rock Grant and Tim Lee Demise. But something that does worry me is this remote control car having a relationship with a sim that doesn't exist or maybe was deleted. <laughs> Again, some more here, and Therapist has a relationship with someone as well. Yep, more for Therapist. Uh, Olive's Garden victims for some reason. Grim Reaper is here too, in this corruption party I guess. Bula Zombie, and now the Sim Wants and Fears, where these non existent Sims, probably deleted Sims, have wants and fears, meaning their wants and fears are junk data floating around the hood and might attach to uh, newborn Sims or even pets that are generated, like strays, which is what leads to problems like children, toddlers having lifetime wants? There's a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of deleted sims with wants and fears. That's not good. <laughs> and finally, we have some buggy memories. Sim does not exist. Incorrect subject instance. It's interesting, it's pointing to Knut Futa, but it's apparently pointing to a different subject instance, so a different sim who doesn't exist or just isn't Knut Futa, isn't the right sim. Now I, I do look through the logs before I record, just if there's anything that I can't really explain very well, so I look things up. And from my understanding, with owner does not exist, with these Jessica Abadi, the dead sim, not the townie, 
uh, Holly Anderson having memories of Knut Futa and Blair Mesa Towney having memories of Daniel Greaves' death. I believe the memory that Hoodchecker is not liking is reporting as buggy is the gossip memory, the blue memory in Simpie, rather than the actual memory itself. Anyway, just see what it can clean up. Move. Yes, I do. As always, always back up your hood uh, before you do hood checker. It is a very good tool, but it's always just recommended because it is going to change your hood. It manages to remove these weird relationships between sims who either don't exist or are deleted or the NPCs having these relationships with sims that don't exist for some reason. And it is able to remove the dangling sim wants and fears. Okay, it can remove this memory. The sim does not exist. Newspaper delivery person is familiar with a lot. It's able to fix these incorrect subject instances where Knut Futa's memory is pointing to another sim. But it doesn't seem to have been able to fix these unexpected sim subject or the owner does not exist memories, which is interesting. So just check it now and it hasn't been able to remove these memories. I imagine you may have to do that manually with SimPE or as I would recommend using a clean template because they would have done that all for you. And of course, even though the family ties, sim relations, sim wants and fears and the other memories that were able to be removed are clean in her checker, it does not mean it is now safe. It's still got problems with DNA, it's still got problems with erroneous or extra family ties and of course the dead sims regardless of whether you leave them to rest in peace, they they have junk data floating around. And there's still the issue of other deleted sims whose data is just free real estate for anyone to take. <laughs> so, to sum everything up, yep, the answer to the title is still the same as it was in the first video. Even if you refrain from necromancing, there are still major problems with the living sims, such as missing DNA and family ties, not to mention all the townies whose career and school information are corrupted. Plus, Spella adds the more dangerous form of Sims 2 corruption to the mix. Should you play Strange Town? Absolutely! The lore is an exhibition of the sims at its best. Every single sim is interesting and has their own story to tell, and the aesthetic is out of this world. Should you play it as it comes? Hmm, maybe? If you don't think you'll play for long or if you don't really mind bugs and glitches. I mean, the eeriness of corruption does complement the overall vibe of Strange Town. But if you're planning on squeezing as much gameplay out of it as possible, it is advised you check out one of the clean templates. There may be more out there, but the two most popular are by Meet Me to the River or Dorsal Axe. Neither is cleaner than the other, since both have done a great job of sweeping up Strangetown's mountain of mess, but they are slightly different. In Meet Me to the Rivers version, all townies and NPCs, as well as far ancestors such as grand or great grandparents have been removed, and you can get either a version with Belagoth as a townie or one without. Ages have also been tweaked, which may be ideal if you, say, want Jenny to have more children or Olive to find another vi- Lucky man! But it also means, for example, Johnny is a few days younger, thus you can't follow the birthday party scripted event, though this can also be triggered by throwing a normal party. In Dorsal Axe's version, all townies and NPCs, including Bella, remain, as do the ancestors. It's really up to you which one you'd prefer. Both will be linked down in the description. Finally, always remember to practice good hygiene. Whether you're playing the vanilla hood or a clean template, make sure you have all the recommended anti-corruption mods listed on my blog. 
Back up and use her checker regularly and read the guide on the Sims Wiki on how to avoid corruption. All of this will ensure your hoods won't blow up in a big fiery ball visible from space. Okay, so if you've made it this far, thank you so 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 much for watching. Just a warning that I might get really soppy and emotional, but I just wanted to take the time to thank everyone for their support. I don't know how or why this has happened, but I'm now almost at 500 subscribers and I am just every synonym of ecstatic, bewildered and grateful. <laughs> I also feel bad because I feel like I never properly thanked everyone for 100 subs, let alone 200 or 300 or 400 when I just want to scoop you all up and bake you all some cookies or cakes of your choice. <laughs> you guys are an absolutely awesome community and I cannot thank you enough for accepting me in. So I can't record next week but I am going to pre-record a follow-up to the DNA experiment video to upload instead because a few of you guys have suggested some things for me to do plus some new information has been brought to my attention and there's something I completely forgot to take into account for the first video anyway so that will hopefully be next week. I also have plans for shorter informational videos regarding corruption and an idea for an experiment that might fail but if it works it could produce some interesting results. I've also been wondering if anyone would be interested in a gameplay series where I play my Pleasant View. It's at the start of round 9, so there would be a lot of catching up and recapping to do, so it will kind of be more like a soap opera custom hood rather than the original Pleasant View everyone's familiar with. Oh, and of course, next up in this series will be How Corrupt is Veronaville anyway. But it may take some time since it's very similar to Strange Town in terms of bulkness. Anyway, whichever video goes up next, I really hope I'll see you all there too. Thank you again for watching and remember to stay safe, be good, and most of all, happy sinning! Bye!